I'm here today with one of New York City's top attorneys and best-selling authors, Philip Howard, who has penned The Death of Common Sense and The Rule of Nobody. He also founded and is chairman of Common Good, an incredible government reform group. And Philip, cannot thank you enough for taking the time today uh, to sit down. Really, really appreciate it. Before we begin the show and talk about your life today, let's talk a little bit about what life was like growing up as a kid in Kentucky. Well, my father was a preacher, and I grew up in eastern Kentucky, so it was, it was sort of the heart of darkness. I mean, we, we had floods and pestilence, and I was bitten by a rabid cat and had rabies treatments, but I seem to have survived it more or less mentally intact. Most of the people that we interview on the show are focused on the finance sector. Obviously, you're not. Your background's been in the, in the legal sector. Take us through your career. Um, well, I, uh, I got out of college, uh, came to New York, worked as a photographer part-time, and worked for a branch of the Ford Foundation. I had actually worked in, in college. I'd worked at the Oak Ridge National Lab for three summers. I was a gopher for a Nobel Prize winner called Eugene Wigner, and that was really my education. I ended up publishing a paper on post-nuclear war recovery at the age of 20, I guess. Um, so I was always interested in public policy, but I didn't see any public policy jobs that were any good. You ended up going to work in some big bureaucracy and being kicked around by some politician who didn't know anything. So uh, I went to law school and because uh, I couldn't think of anything else to do, and then became a lawyer and had a you know I've had a very successful uh, Wall Street law career, and worked at Sullivan Cromwell and started my own firm with sort of an M and A boutique called originally Howard Darby and Levin, and uh, we merged with uh, with the top Washington firm Covington and Burling about 15 years ago. Um, and I became vice chairman of Covington and Burling, and that was very successful. And I've had lots of interesting legal matters over the years and Supreme Court cases and things like that. Yeah, well, the, the neat thing about you, though, is that you've been phenomenally successful uh, in your law practice, but at the same time, you've also been um, uh, somebody who's uh, been acutely aware of the issues we have in government, uh, acutely aware of the issues that we have with our legal system, you know, and, and would love to talk about your, your, your writing. Yeah, well, it's interesting. Uh, uh, the way I, I always had the idea that being a lawyer would allow me to be an active citizen. And I think that's true. Mm -hmm. I, not very many people take advantage of it nowadays. Laws become more of a business and people go grind it out and then they have successful careers and then they die. Uh, but, but I always thought that life should have, you know, more in store than that. And so even as a young lawyer, I became head of the, the equivalent of the zoning board for East Midtown Manhattan. I would chair public hearings mm -hmm. when I was at Sullivan and Cromwell. And once a month, I'd chair public hearings on zoning barriers just to, just to be a citizen. Well, you were also involved with uh, Saving Grand Central, weren't you? Yeah, and so then I got on the board of the Municipal Arts Society and I was uh, either the council or chair of the Municipal Arts Society for three years, I mean, for, for three decades. We saved Grand Central. Uh, uh, we sponsored the Tribute and Light Memorial at the, after 9-11, you know, the Twin Lights. Mm -hmm. That was, we organized that. Um, uh, you know, lots, we saved the lights on Times Square. They were going to rip them all out and turn it into Sixth Avenue. And one of my colleagues, architect colleagues on the board, Hugh Hardy, said, People don't come to New York to visit Sixth Avenue. And so doing civic work really gave me an education about how you could influence government without sitting in the chair saying, I'm Senator X or the mayor of Y or whatever. And, um, and in, in the 90s, about 20 years ago, I began to think that there was something structurally wrong with the way we organize government. Because I had all these friends who worked for government, and they weren't jerks. They had common sense. And yet they couldn't do what they knew was right. Mm -hmm. And I kept, uh, I didn't set out to write a book. I just was really curious why smart people couldn't act sensibly. Right. And uh, I ended up writing a book called The Death of Common Sense. Which turned out to be a national bestseller. Yeah, it was one of the big bestsellers of the year, uh, amazingly. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, and I ended up working with Clinton and Gore on reinventing government and writing an introduction to a book they wrote. And, um, and all of a sudden, I was sort of burst onto the national stage as an expert in how legal structures affect human behavior. Mm -hmm. 
And so now I've written uh, four books, advised, you know, the president since then, a number of governors and others, and, uh, and I'm very active in trying to um, organize an overhaul of American government to radically simplify it and to restore responsibility, human responsibility is the main uh, mechanism by which both things get done and people are held accountable, not kind of endless, mindless bureaucracy. Got it. I mean, right now I feel like everybody is handcuffed. While it's nice to talk about it, it's like how do you implement change? How are you right. going to make that happen? Change happens in big gulps. It doesn't happen in Small ball doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So you think about this country, the big changes in the way government has worked over the years have occurred every 30 or 40 years. The 1960s was the last time, then the 1930s, then the Progressive Era, then the Civil War, then Jacksonian democracy. It's like a metronome, you know, every 30 or 40 years. Um, we're overdue for a change. Uh, it hasn't happened in part because society is so affluent. Um, so we've been able to um, absorb the inefficiency and the frustration of this current system. But it's a progressive disease. It's, uh, the paralysis is much worse now than it was 20 years ago when I was working with Clinton and Gore. Mm -hmm. And it'll be worse again in five years. So everybody knows the system's broken. And now uh, Jeb Bush has started quoting my new book, The Rule of Nobody on the Stop. And a couple of Supreme Court justices are. And you know, people are beginning to talk the language of we need a fundamental over. We need to clean out this system of law that's kind of piled up for decades. I mean, we have farm subsidies from the New Deal that have been obsolete for 75 years. Um, we need to clean out the stables in order to be able to move forward. So, Philip, right now it seems like we're heading towards a crisis situation. Um, you know, how do, we, how do we fix it? Where do you see us in 20 years? Well, I think there will be a precipitating event, and it will be a combination of good leadership, hopefully, saying we need to fix and and people waking up for, but because of some news event, uh, to, to the need to clean out this system and to remake it so that people are in charge again. I mean, right now, literally, democracy is run by dead people. It's an accumulation of laws and regulations that tell everybody what to do, Nobody's making deliberate choices about how to do things. Is that the rule? They're just following rule books. Right. And, it, and it, you can't balance a budget. You can't build the infrastructure. You can't maintain order in a classroom. You know, you can't do anything sensibly. One of the projects that we're working on at my not-for-profit, which is called Common Good, is, uh, a, uh, is a project to reimagine how, do we, how we approve infrastructure, to change the law, mm -hmm. to, to present a proposal. And if we change the words on a piece of paper about how infrastructure gets approved, we could hire two million people for the foreseeable future, beginning in about a year, and they would be working for probably two decades or more, modernizing American infrastructure, creating a greener footprint, improving America's competitiveness, with a lot of good middle class jobs. Mm -hmm. And all you have to do is change words on a piece of paper to do that. Right, right. And so why don't we do that? So, you know, so it's a question of sort of building the public demand for that.